This that new media company covering everything. I'm talking in news you ain't heard of. Cause you know it's getting buried. Social justice, yeah, the stuff you need to know about. Fucking politics that the corporate news won't cover. You know they don't think that you could see under. But you can now. Cause the people we cover, they may not be famous. But their stories should be heard. Yeah, every voice matters. We should rise and fall together. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday. I have no idea what the date is. I think it's still April, um, but welcome. <laughs> welcome. And um, good morning to you, Mr. Andy. How are you this morning? Good morning in this fine September afternoon. <laughs> I don't think it's September, but okay, close enough. <laughs> It's rainy and cold. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Oh, nice. Nice. Ex well, yeah. So, and as I was telling you this morning, um, curly hair ladies have problems with the humidity. So, um, yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry to rub it in. <laughs> I hardly think so. Not today. Not today. <laughs> what? That's some old school Jerry Curl. Probably not. <laughs> you meet some interesting people at ballparks, let me tell you. So so I live in Chicago, and so every year, Chicago is not my team. I'm not one of those people where you just adopt a team. I have a lifelong commitment. It was in my wedding vows. Uh, lifelong commitment to uh, the Denver Broncos, for good or bad. So uh, part of... Uh, the the issue that we have here is um, I can only see the Denver Broncos play when they come to Indianapolis or Chicago. And my son is a Chicago fan. So he always gets so upset when we go to the, like the preseason games or whatever because everything else is expensive. And as we're walking to the stadium, you see nothing but orange jerseys and little horsey hats. And he's like... No, this is Chicago. This is Bears country. <laughs> I'm like, apparently not. <laughs> Everybody loves Denver, so yeah. But um, there's a there's a uh, an experience like that that happens in baseball um, because every year they put in the schedule that the Blue Jays travel to the West Coast and they play in Seattle, so there's a huge contingency of Blue Jays. South from DC, Great Columbia, to go to the game, and it's it's it actually sounds like a home game for the Blue Jays when they play it. <laughs> it's very confusing for the players. They think they're at home. <laughs> so, okay, so my husband, he's a, a Purdue alum, and occasionally we would go to those games and. When OSU comes to play at Purdue, it is nothing but red. All the black and gold in the stadium is drowned out by the red from Ohio State. And they're, they're big rivals, so he would get really upset. Him and his, his college buddies would be like, who keeps selling them tickets? Who keeps doing it? <laughs> I'm like, I don't think that they can control that, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, exactly. And he just, he doesn't get it, but yeah, that's Purdue. But, um, so this morning, super exciting. Um, yeah. And, and I sent her a text this morning. I was like, it's rainy and crappy, but it feels like Christmas. And I promised that I promised for myself that I wasn't going to fangirl too much, but I can't really make that promise for Andy. <laughs> so... 
So um, we are super excited to welcome a, a very special guest. Her credentials are off the chart. So um, let's, let's go ahead and, and get her in here. Make sure her sound is good. But this is Professor Lua Yuli from the University of Kansas. And um, her credentials are just, there's a mile long, but I, I'm just going to sum it up and say certified badass in everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Professor Yuli. How are you? I'm um, good, good. No, I'm awesome. Yay! So happy you're here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, okay, no, no. Bring it down. Bring it down just a little. Just a little. Because um, I was hoping this morning that Andy and I could play good cop, bad cop, because everybody loves Andy. Andy's so nice. And we're going to let him play good cop. I'll play bad cop. Um, so this week we started talking about the basics of, um, it, it's a principle of warfare, protect your supply line. If you want to win a war, you've got to protect your supply line. And then we took that principle and started walking through everyday things like political campaigns and household budgets and all of these things that we're seeing right now where the supply chain is breaking down. And one of the interesting things was in journalism, we have um, a disparity of media outlets that will allow certain conversations. For example, Truth Dig, we talked about, um, fired most of their journalist staff and shut down because they were trying to unionize. And the outlet itself is funded by a millionaire who didn't like some of those conversations that were happening on the left. So, th so this is where the supply came in. If you're a journalist and you're getting your paycheck from a millionaire who doesn't want to have those kind of conversations, guess what's going to happen? You're about to lose that paycheck and your supply line to tell your story, right? So, so this is kind of why I'm really excited to have you in here because um, <laughs> you just take such an amazing take on all of these issues from socioeconomic to delving into a little bit of the political space and how policy matters and the cause and effect of everything, right? So, so um, before we get started, I'm going to let you talk about your experience and your credentials because it, the list is just so damn long. So, <laughs> so take it away. Idea. I have access to data in 
anybody who's engaged with this message right now has access to the internet and can look up but sometimes there aren't notified, but I think that we need to create space for people who have knowledge because of this reality. People who have knowledge because of this experience of one conversation um, and being taken seriously. Uh, so I'm not going to give you a list of my credentials, but you can visit me uh, at talkmore.com or you can search me a Hewitt. And if you search me a Hewitt, you will find me because I'm the only one in the Oh, we already put it in our link. So, <laughs> But you make a great point because um, one of the reasons why we started this network is because everybody's got a story. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a professor or a doctorate or whatever. Um, so you're right. Let's make the distinction between um, everybody's got a voice and we're all a part of this big story. However... I just witnessed somebody with no credentials, like you said, doing the armchair doctor and, and arguing with Dr. Burdett on virology studies. And I'm like, no girl, don't know. <laughs> this guy's got like 12 years of schooling and 20 years of, you yeah, know. So there's, there's, a, there's a place for it. But like Andy and I have had just regular um, fantastic people on who aren't credentialed, but have an opinion and, and brought up an idea that we're like, yeah, let's expand on it. Let's talk about it. So, so, uh, totally agree. So now let's get into some of the nitty gritty, right? You, um, you wrote a paper and I was discussing this with some other people who have very strong opinions one way or another. Um, so I live in the city of Chicago, and anytime you mention to somebody about Chicago, they immediately go to gangs, and they go to guns. And I'm like, no, there's so much more going on here than what you see on TV. Um, but you brought up a proposal about paying, correct me if I'm wrong, paying gang members to not engage in gang activity. Is that a UBI? What, what, what are we talking about? What does that look like? You know, that is, that, that is not, if, if, we, if we live in a world of UBI, most of them would be stopped. If we lived in a world of job guarantees, most of them would be stopped. It wouldn't matter. But what I did was look, and it turns out, I found this cutting kind of hole And so when I started this research, I made a big body, but let me just be clear, I don't have any personal guidance and knowledge of this. We we shouldn't laugh, but. <laughs> to try to get folks out of here. And they, at least in contemporary times, are almost... Ex 
exclusively treating gang members as murderers, as thieves, as criminals, mm -hmm. as yeah. the non-glorified version of the mafia, right? Like, because in America, we glorify the mafia and we love Cosa Nostra. But I, I used to live in Italy, and so they do not love uh, any version of the mafia because each region has their own. Um, but we do. But street gangs are not treated that way. They're just the worst. Um, and so we treat them only like criminals. But what was interesting was that the, and this is a really bad name for this area of expertise, the gangology, um, which is basically the sociology of gangs, um, really made clear that gang members were not out there to get money. And then there were a couple of studies that came out that said gang members don't actually make a lot of money. So not only are they not in it for money, they don't make a lot of money. What they're in it for is all of the other benefits that come along with economic engagement and economic status in our society, right? So they're creating capital for themselves when they have absolutely no access to capital. And so what I say is, hey, look, what gangs really do the money-making part and the crime part is tiny. What gangs really do is create capital. And me, a non-gang member citizen of the United States, if the government wants to take my capital, the government pays me in exchange for it, right? If the government wants my house, they pay for it. If the government wants me to take some action, or if a private party wants me to take some action, they typically pay for it even sometimes when they don't have to, if it's the government actor. And so I said, if we really want gang members to stop engaging in this economic, capital producing activity, then we should pay them just like we pay regular citizens. Because number one, they're not out there primarily committing crimes. And number two, all they're trying to do is have access to the economy. They want a job. They want a job, we won't let them get one in the sanctioned part of the economy, so they create their own. Um, and so, you know, it's it sounds radical until you realize, you know, I'm not paying people not to murder people. Um, I'm paying people not to do the other things that we associate with gangs, wear their special colors, display their special hand symbols, which are all the things that they do Right. And the gang members, they're they're ingenious. Mm -hmm. Right. They're converting all of these relatively worthless things. They have no intrinsic value. They're converting it into capital that they can then use to make ends meet. And the economics, like the financial part of it, shows that the average gang member does not or only makes ends meet. And so if we can, you know, pay them, give them ends meet. It'd be fine. So it's almost like um, activity in the gang is about the social structure and it, it's kind of economically <coughs> like a multi-level marketing scheme. If you keep if you keep growing your network and and working the plan, at some point you're going to re reach the top and, and make money. So what we do with those types of activities is you're right. We redirect that behavior. So going into the, the prison pipeline that Andy and I were also touching on on Monday, um, we're redirecting resources and the supply chain of bodies from for-profit prisons to keeping it in the local municipality, whether it's city or village or whatever, and, and redirecting that to something that's a little more positive and can potentially distribute capital across the whole, or at least the value of work across the whole. Would you say so, that's accurate? You know, I want to be, I, I want to be honest. I'm sort of on the fence about that. Right. So like this project where I talk about compensating a uh, street gang members is really about using the existing economic tools and demonstrating that we don't deploy the existing economic tools across the grain to all actors in the economy, right? We change the rules for different people. I wouldn't call a gang a multi-level marketing scheme. I actually just call it a corporation. Hmm. That's what it is. And so maybe we think that all corporations are multi-level marketing schemes, which is not off, but 
I don't think we, right? Like it's just a corporation. And so, yeah, the people at the top make the most and the people at the bottom don't, right? Like labor doesn't get a share <laughs> in the equity. Um, but we don't teach, we don't treat the gang corporation the same as the, you know, Starbucks corporation. Mm. And that, that, and all I'm trying to show is that we could, and it would be more effective because it actually gets at what we, what we think is important and what they think is important. There's a whole separate question about whether and to what extent the sanctioned society's views of the good and the right and the productive are correct. And so, you know, I labor. Most of us labor for our living. We are wage earners. And I am not always convinced that the toil that we do is somehow good uh, for society. Um, and in fact, a lot of the good that we do is Oh, I think we're losing her internet. Oh no. Hang on, hang on. Wait. Are we here? Let her catch up. Are we here? We could hear you. Uh we're just your screen is a little froze. Yeah. Oh, you're back. Ooh. Okay. I did it did not tell me that I was having an issue over on this side. Um <sighs> Yeah, but what I was saying is that, you know, I, I I'm not convinced that we should pull all folks into the existing economy um, as it exists because the existing economy is crappy and the existing economy is unjust. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to rethink what's productive um, and what we want people to be doing and how we actually pay people or recognize positive contributions um, to the economy, right? Because most of the good stuff that we do, or at least some part of the good stuff that we do, we don't get paid for. Um, and we don't get any compensation for other than warm feelings um, in our hearts, right? Like caregiving um, and art, right? Like unless you're Brad Pitt, uh, and then we can have a different conversation about uh, what you're producing, but right, the painter <laughs> toiling away in their house, the poet, right. um, if they're not Pablo Neruda, they're not, they're not making money. And that's that, that's the issue that we've had always this, you know, with the neoliberalism uh, that's that's been uh, prevalent in our society for the last 50 years is that we've allowed the private sector to define what a job is. Right. That we've said that they're going to define that that it's hard work, that it's going to make us money, that anything that doesn't help us make money is not going to be, to be compensated for. It's not going to be defined. And the other point that I wanted to make about about street gangs is what's the difference between a street gang of youth and a college fraternity, except for a little bit of privilege and sweater vests? Or a lot of privilege and a lot of sweater vests, right? <laughs> 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 and I mean, the research has shown, you know, uh, so again, I'm from Southern California. And so when you think of Southern California and gangs, you think the Crips and the Bloods. Um, but there are huge gangs that are coming out of um, Asian immigrant communities and they are not treated the same way because these gang members, a lot of them, and this is just, right, like I'm not, this is what the evidence shows. A lot of them are kids in the pipeline to go to college. Um, mm. Malibu, California, um, and, you know, Santa Cruz, California, and um, Venice, they, for many years, had a really violent, you know, uh, surfer gangs um, and gangs of white kids. Um, and those gangs are not in the conversation of the Crips um, and the Blood. So even gangs uh, that we call gangs aren't all treated the same, much less frat, frat boys um in our universities across the country we happen to know one of those um <laughs> white boy gang members now reformed so yeah yeah and definitely treated a little bit differently um well and they get the shows right the sons of anarchy which you know i i but everyone was loving the sons of anarchy yeah um meanwhile uh you don't you don't see a you know made to be glorified 
show about you know latino gang members you get mi familia and they have face tattoos and they're supposed to be super scary yeah exactly so can we shift a little bit into another topic um so this this still goes with supply is protecting your supply line for the betterment of your overall mission but you also talk about um the myth of autonomy right so so here's where i'm going to push back a little bit right so i pull myself up by my bootstraps i go get up i go to work i do everything right or at least what i was taught to do right um, and I'm the one who made this decision. I'm the one who did it. And, um, I didn't rely on anyone else, no handouts, no nothing. You know, the, the social security disability that I, I, I earned that, um, America. <laughs> so, yeah. so Not you tell me where I'm wrong on, on my sense of autonomy, because right now I have big government telling me that I have to stay home and not go get a paycheck. So where am I wrong? I, I think the, the difference that we need to keep in our heads is autonomy versus agency, right? Agency is the idea that you have choices, that you may have choices, um, and that you get to make them. And that when you make those choices fully informed, um, we should respect that those are the choices that you've made given the landscape and the context in which you find yourself situated. When I say autonomy is a myth, I do not say that agency is a myth. Um, I don't have lots to say on agency because I think that recognizing autonomy as a myth makes agency difficult, but I do not have a fight with agency. What I have a fight with is, right, well, I earn social security. Oh yeah, sure, your labor, qualified you for social security, but there was a rule in place that folks came in and through the political process, good or bad, determined what labor would qualify one hmm. for social security, right? There is a set of rules against which we have concluded for money, you buy house or for money, you pay rent. And without those set of rules, no matter how hard you labor, right? No matter what you do, you are not going to be able to get a house, right? For money, you get land, right? And, and, and in fact, the, we've made it such that it's really hard for you to go. You can't go in the middle of Chicago, find an open piece of land and like build a house on it and be, and be protected in that open piece of land. People do do that. Those people are housing insecure and their homes are destroyed and taken down on the regular, right? So if you want a house that's gonna stay there, you have to follow these rules. In the same way, every contract that we enter into, and I'm not talking about the ones we signed, when you go buy a Snickers, you enter into a contract, right? Every single one of those little transactions that we have are shaped by rules, right? When you have healthcare, if you pay for it, it nonetheless is created by a system in which we said private health care that you pay for. In the same way, if we said single payer private or, or public health care that you don't pay for with the dollars from your private bank account. All of those are rules. And that's what we're challenging when uh, I and other folks say autonomy is a myth. We're not working alone. We're working with each other and we're working in a network of laws and rules. Um, that doesn't say anything about your agency. Okay. And that right. also that, that shows makes... you, shows you how, how much currently this pandemic shows how interconnected that we need to be just because we're all locked in our homes right now and how everybody's going that shit crazy because I can't see anybody. I can't talk to anybody. And that's the interconnectedness of our society. Right. Well, because one of the things, right, well, one of the things this stay at home situation for those of us who are experiencing it shows, right, one, that we didn't pay attention to just how much our lives were structured by the background rules that people like to say are not there, right? Every day that we can go out of our house, 
It's because there's a decision made not to have a stay at home order, even when we didn't think about that. But the, on the other hand, right, it is really showing how we're destabilized because one, we haven't allowed folks when we consign all of our networking to private interpersonal relationships, right? We don't have any structure for when those, those networks can't be supported, right? This is exactly what you're saying. People are going crazy because they can't see people. Well, they're going crazy because they can't see people because they need physical interaction because we have decided that one-on-one -on -one personal interactions and the largesse of our friends is how we get our needs met. Instead of saying, oh, that's great. And it's wonderful to have interpersonal relationships and charity. But you know what? We should also make sure that the person who has nobody is networked and and built into our system so that when we can't literally physically be together, we can still um, have our needs met. And we can also figure out how to keep people safe while the essential stuff is going on, which we have not figured out. Yeah. Okay, so there was a tweet that you sent the other day um, along <laughs> this lines when we talked about communications and it really caught my attention because you were bringing people to a space that they might not have considered, especially our students. And um, I forget exactly what you said, but you were you brought up the point that, okay, just because you have put classes online does not necessarily mean that your students can actively participate. Um, and so keep these things in mind. And you kind of went through some examples. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, about uh, that connectivity and, and interconnectedness um, that we need now? Yeah, so this all came up because I was, uh, you know, had to go out of my house um, at the same time that I had something that I needed to do. And so I was just on my phone. I had no access to like the internet. Um, and I needed a piece of information while I was on a Zoom call on my phone. And I, j it was an easy piece of information to find. And I just couldn't find it. And I couldn't respond. And I couldn't do all the things that I needed to do. And I mean, in the back of my head, I understood uh, that I'm in a relatively privileged position with respect to my, my access to tech. Um, but it was at that moment when I said, you know what? There are students across the country who are lucky enough to be trying to do this thing on the phone. Um, and that is just mind boggling. A university or a primary or secondary education just on your phone. And then I started to think about all of the ways that our new reality is dangerous, right? So if I can't get connected right, right? My connection problems right now have nothing to do with my, my personal access to internet. It has to do with the fact that everybody in the country is trying to be on the internet right now, right? But yeah. some kids, some students, some folks, some professors don't have the financial resources to get themselves connected in a way that allows them to stream and download and record videos in order to engage. Then, and I assigned my students um, and a, a, like a, a couple of like video responses and I asked them to walk around their neighborhood and film it and send it to me. And as I was having this experience and I happened to know a little bit about the socioeconomic status of my students, but I started thinking more broadly. And I was like, what if you live in a neighborhood that you want to cover? What if you live in a house that you want to cover? And in fact, I was on a video conference with a student and I asked where they were. And what I meant was geographically, were they still in our town or had they left? But you could see the fear on the student's face because they thought I was trying to ask them to show their home. And they, oh. no, I can't show you. It's just, we just didn't clean up. And the student went on and on. And I was like, I just wanted, I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to know what city. And so that got me thinking about, well, people live in homes that they cover up and life situations that they cover up. And then we talked about the cultural things that go on in your house, right? And so there's the people with books on the walls or tech or whatever in big art. And there's other people who have nothing and whose walls are falling down. There's students that we have in our country who live in their cars. Um, and again, this goes beyond, right? People are sitting in their houses in their PJs, but that's not accessible for everybody. 
Um, and so this entire this entire system of going online and making that a part of the new normal brings people into people's lives and homes and and personal circumstances in a way that they are normally able to hide. And maybe they shouldn't have to hide, but they are normally able to hide in order to get access to spaces that we exclude poor people from, that we exclude very, very different immigrants from, right? So if you're home, we, like we don't, you're required to have a bed, right? In fact, you can have your kids taken away if you don't have a bed. There's countries in the world where it's just like standard. It's not a poverty thing. It's just that beds are not a thing. And so the way we live, right? Then you can think broadly, people who are um, LGBTQ and don't want you to know that in their house is a same sex partner. We're suddenly demanding that you bring work and school and life in our homes. And that really, it really makes it dangerous. It really makes it dangerous for people. And that actually increases the stress uh, for some of our, our learners. Um, but it's a broader, it's a broader question because we could make all this stuff free. Mm. And we've chosen to ascribe it to this neoliberal market. Instead of saying it's 2020, everybody needs access to internet. Everybody needs housing such that the pressure associated therewith would be dissipated. Yeah. It's interesting um, to consider this because we had a, I guess it was last week, week before we had a, a citizens group, um, Internet Freedom, and they're working on bringing true broadband networks into communities and getting such pushback from policymakers and um, corporations. Uh, because what they're trying to do is the the broadband that we are sold by corporations who um, have monopolies in many areas is not true broadband. So when all of this came down with um, people having to use their Internet and students and things, we struggled with, number one, Internet accessibility, especially for um, we have a high number of students who are, are you know, housing insecure. Um, so what do you do for those students? And then for those that do have homes that are secure, didn't have internet or didn't have a computer. So now you have kids from elementary all the way up to college. You have all of these problems and concerns. And now for a geographic area, like in my county, you have the load, right? So um, certain times of day, you just cannot get online or it's too slow or it's being throttled or all of these things that, that uh, go into part of what you're saying, aside from just the social impact and the risk that people are, are now being asked to take, um, it's just interesting that this whole situation, when we go back to the argument of supply, has made it so clear where our infrastructure itself is breaking down and causing problems all the way up the chain. Well, and you know what's really interesting? I just was doing some checking up on this. Um, you know, the cell phone providers, there's been, there's not a, you know, a lot of folks only have cell phones, <laughs> right? Um, I don't have a landline currently. Um, and um, they have not been mandated to keep people connected and they're not doing that. And wh what you've seen is that a bunch of places are like, if you couldn't have a phone before, we're gonna give you some access or if you didn't have your phone as a wireless hotspot, we'll give you that in a small measure. But if you were just paying your regular phone bill, there's no abatement. There's no abatement of shutoffs. Um, and of course, abatement is useful, or excuse me, abatement is useless. What you need is forgiveness because if you don't have the money to pay on May 1, you're not going to have the money to pay on June 1 and on uh, uh, you know July 1. Right. That money's never coming. You just no, didn't get it. No. So there's no time for you to go make up a whole month of salary or of hourly wages. Uh, so all, all of these things that we're talking about, um, abatements and moratoria should really be forgiveness. Um, but the cell phone carriers aren't doing it. So these self-same students that we're talking about who can't get access, um, even the ones who do have access are running up on a deadline um, when they won't have access at all. And again, the already existing gulf between access to basic services, basic in 2020 services 
for um, the haves and the have nots is just going to to increase. Oh, absolutely. Yes. The petition. The, oh, go ahead, Andy. I'm sorry. Oh, just just going to say that the other aspect of that entire thing about connectability is that with the pandemic, the uses of the, our phones are are so much more now, right? Like, uh, especially on our level, right? Like, I mean, I we talk about our our kids being on the phone constantly, it being in their hands, right? The kid, your your child has a phone for. I would say a maximum of four weeks before they, it's been dropped and there's a crack down the middle of it. But regardless of that, right, our generation are using our phones more just because we need to, just to, for our own sanity. Well, because this is a worldwide pandemic and uh, our interview with Steve Keen a couple of weeks ago, he looked into it. There's 43 countries that make the iPhone that are involved in the making of the iPhone, if one of those countries has shut down because of the pandemic, there are no iPhones, right? So as these phones start to break down and need to be replaced, they're just not there, right? So now what do we do? Because our one level of connectability in society, now people can't get, right? That's- And huge. I mean, it, you, I, so I teach business organizations to students um, and I talk about, you know, what is the corporation and who does what? And, you know, uh, you gotta, you gotta hand it to him, but then we see how dangerous it is, right? What did Steve Jobs do? He created needs that didn't exist before. Right. But the problem and the danger, right? It's great. I love my phone. I have no problem with this. But the danger of the system in which we have it happen is that we create needs real true needs and we have no meaningful regulation of this new need at a national local or global scale so that this new need can be protected um and that's what we just allow entrepreneurs to to make us reliant on things in the same way that's the same thing with our computers again i'm not saying that they're bad i'm not saying you know go back to pre-technological days to minimize the needs that we have. But having a system that recognizes in new needs and says, ooh, this is now a basic need of our society, not of humans, but of our society. And if it's a basic need, internet, cellular phone access, computers, if these are basic needs, how do we get them met? Okay, here's where I want to jump in. And this was a perfect setup for my next question. And let me apologize in advance. I'm going to put you on the spot with this one. But um, when we talk about corporations and regulation and, uh, and needs, we're going to step back a little bit to a national level. So the Democratic Party is a corporation. And we've seen their arguments in court about their insistence on autonomy that they um, they operate and function at their sole discretion. However, me as a voter, I am paying for their activity through my um, county clerk and ballot access and things like this. So now we have an example where the two notions are at odds, and I'm going to use the New York Democratic Party as an example. They made a unilateral decision between two individuals to cancel one aspect of a primary that is supposed to be public, right? So anybody can sign up to be a voter and engage in the democratic process. And this party organizes candidates and access to um, that engagement. They, they bridge the two, two ideas. And they have decided that you as a voter do not get to cast a vote for this race. And in doing so may have actually, um, I don't know if it's a federal thing because it is a federal race, but we're looking at like the Hatch Act. And, and unduly influencing elections um, through your actions, words, or deeds. So in this space now, you have the Democratic Party, which is a corporation, operates nationally, is supposed to engage with the, the lay voter 
and the candidate in this process, where does the autonomy stop for this corporate entity and where does it begin for the rights of the voter? I, I recognize this is a hugely broad question, but when we're, we're putting in the context of supply and supply chain um, and, and autonomy, does, does any of this make any sense? And if you were queen for a day, how would you pull this apart? Well, <laughs> if I were the, in charge of the world, um, I would, this would not be my problem because the thing that I would do uh, was eliminate uh, partisanship, right? So I have questions about what democracy should mean and what democracy looks like, uh, but I know that it's not partisan. Um, and absent partisanship, uh, this wouldn't be a problem. But um, I think that the, our, our problem here, like in our real world problem, is the sort of reversion um, in some ways to the original function of the corporation. The corporation as we know it began as a set of entities that had state power delegated to them. But what happened in those early days, and I'm not saying the early corporations are great, right? Like the Dutch East, East India Company. I'm not like standing the Dutch East India Company, but like, right, these early corporations had delegated to them state power, state functions. And because of that had huge, huge, huge obligations back to the state and to the people. What we then did was decide, nah, we want corporations to just do whatever they want mm -hmm. and to be engines of capital. That's what we want them to do. That's like capitalism, right? Corporate capitalism, that's what it is. Um, and then, and this really began in the 1920s. So we've been doing it for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, Berlin means uh, the modern corporation and private property. I always cite it because it's just such a great book for folks to read, dense, but just so on point. Uh, and it feels like it was written in 2020 and not the 1920s. But anyways, uh, or 1932, whatever. Um, then we decided, because corporations realized it's really great to have power. Let's rest back that power that we used to have. Um, but let's do it without the obligations. Um, and so that's really the problem that we have, right? We've re-delegated state functions. Like this is healthcare. We re-delegated state functions to the private sector, uh, the quote unquote private sector, but we didn't come with any responsibility. And so the only way to fix this is to reinsert obligations on business, right? Corporations don't exist naturally. Whether they're actual for-profit corporations, whether they're non-profit entities, they don't exist. We create them by law, right? Out of nothing. We create them by law. And because we do that, it is actually really easy to ensure that the DNC doesn't trample on the voting rights of the people. All we have to do is say, yeah, no, we're not running it like that. The problem is democratic politics, Republican politics, lowercase democratic politics have been wholly occupied by forces for whom actual democracy is dangerous. Ooh. Actual democracy, meaning governance by the demos, the people. And, you know, therefore they want to control it. Um, and until, until those forces are tumbled um, or toppled or until control is wrested from those forces, you will see these kinds of, I want to say small, just because they're not systemic um, incursions into your rights and folks will bend over backwards. The lawyers will bend over back your, backwards to explain how no laws have been broken and how your rights um, haven't been violated because the primaries are just an expression of your interest and they don't actually control um, in nominations because the parties have that. But you know, me as a voter, who's actually not a member of any political party, doesn't get to actually choose who's on that ballot. And so these private organizations are doing a lot of government work or work that is theoretically supposed to be done by the people. 
um, without any, with, with complete, with complete agency, though they're still not autonomous, right? Because the laws that exist or the laws that we allow not to exist are still what are there allowing them to do that. Okay, so you just brought that full circle between um, agency and authority, <laughs> and I'm just, I get goosebumps. So, um, so then a follow-up to that, because I was not able to stump you in any way, shape, or form, and I'm so impressed, but uh, me as a little tiny voter, I, I can't afford, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to stand up in front of court, $100,000 to take my case to the state Supreme Court. What do I do? How do how do how do we fix this? I mean, and this day is exactly where we are, recognizing that you, as a little tiny voter, or me, as a single solitary voter, are not the space of engagement. It's us together, right? Because if we light those fires under folks if we get them into spaces both physically and then you know notwithstanding voter suppression um all in the ballot box um the the because there's so much faith in the rigged system uh it's not changing fast enough uh for it to be untangled in one election right and so the the work is really grassroots getting all of us to go um, getting all of us on fire, getting all of us to realize that even if the system fails me and the choices are bad, showing folks that I matter uh, is gonna work is gonna work faster than the forces that are rigging the system because the system wasn't rigged in 2016. The system has been rigged since 17. 98 and it's been slowly being tweaked right and it's our lack of uh, action to to reform it in our view um that allows it to get to this point where we are today where it just feels like and then you were on a roll and you felt like there was momentum and it was smacked down but that smack was the product of actually a really slow moving force, little changes, gerrymandering, right? Little changes, rolling back the Voting Rights Act. But there's still millions and millions of us who can together act quickly um, to make things change. <sighs> okay, I, I, I can't <laughs> Breathe, Karen, breathe. Oh my, oh my God, yeah. Um, and she inadvertently stumbled into the um, I hate Don Ford fan club because this is something Don has been saying for years, too. He's like, it's not that elections, this election will be rigged or can it be? He's like, it is. It is. The mechanisms and levers are already there. It's just who's who's doing it. And how much, like with Iowa, we saw where it just went off the rails completely. Um, but in Maine, that was the and test one. That was that was the test primary, right? They wanted to see how far they could get, what they could get away with for the for the next one. Right, right, the, right exactly. The so, so they got a little more clever when they went to the <laughs> East Coast with Maine and Massachusetts, even though exit polls are still double digits um, out of sync we're real quiet about that we can point to iowa but we don't talk about these other states so um people people don't get the the entire revolutionary thing that's happened right they don't understand what this was all about because they've taken bernie they have put bernie on the pedestal right and so that's all they could see is bernie because they're just looking up well if, if Bernie got knocked off that pedestal, the problem was you put him up there, right? So that's, the, now that he's not there anymore, the what you were looking at is gone. So now you don't see the rest of it, right? The whole idea of the revolution wasn't about Bernie. Bernie was the vehicle in which the 200 plus 
progressive candidates that have now learned MMT from Fadal Kaboob that are running in this election cycle was made possible, right? That whole grassroots movement, and this is all, Bertie has talked about nothing but this, right? About starting the ground up, not me, us, right? That all of that had to change. That infrastructure from below had to start taking over and taking root and moving upward before any of this was going to be possible, right? And it's happened. And would we even be having this conversation if it wasn't for Bernie, right? There's so, so all of that is in place. It's just that people are looking at the shiny object above them, but not realizing the foundation that's being built below them, right? So. Excellent point. <clears throat> Excellent point. I, I totally agree on, on that front. And and I think that's that's what we're seeing with this push now for down ballot and why we have been so active here on this network to pull in um, particularly challengers to incumbents because they're not getting a voice or a platform in traditional media. So, so we're doing it here so that um, uh, in the hopes that voters can make an informed decision. Here is what you've had. Here's their argument. Here's something new. You know, decide for yourself. So so I think that that work is really important and all of the independent media who is doing it because we have shored up our supply line. I'm not getting a paycheck from, from a millionaire who's going to curtail what I say. Um, so that helps tremendously so that we can have Professor Huley on and we can have, um, I do have one burning question, one super important question, and I hope that you will answer it honestly. Matt Forstater, is he as funny all the time or... <laughs> Because I only met him one time, but every time I spoke to him, he had the snarkiest, ridiculous thing. I mean, he's got that dry, wry sense of humor. Well, I was going to say, you know, I think that that's your, that like, I am from California. Um, and I say that we have, like, our cultural foundation is, like, basic Hollywood. Um, and so I actually laughed because I was like, only after you said it. That I say, oh, he is funny. That's what that is called, right? Like, that's what is happening. It is comical <laughs> because it is, yeah, but always like that. Yes. Um, you, but you weren't supposed to say it out loud because now he knows. <laughs> and he'll be impossible to live with now. Oh. Yeah, no, but I was like, okay, so I, I went to the MMT conference in New York, and I still maintain that if you want to have the smartest, snarkiest deck of Cards Against Humanity, you just put some of those blank cards out for all of those professors because... Um, <laughs> They, they're just, it was to the point where every once in a while I would be listening and somebody would be talking and they'd say something and it would take me a second and be like, did you just, that was, they're just hilariously funny. So um, a shout out to, to, to Matt, hope you're watching. And why don't you come on the show and we can show everybody his, his, his humor. So um, this is awesome. Well, um, Professor, thank you so much. And we haven't even scratched the surface of all the topics that you are so profoundly knowledgeable in and just the, the depth of insight into the nuances and all the complexities that go into each of these subjects is just, um, it's overwhelming and awe-inspiring. And I hope that, that we can entice you to get up early again and, and come back. Well, I have small children, so this was not early, but yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> right, now we can't promise you any capital. You know, it will actually, maybe not financial capital, but social capital all day long. Okay, all right. <laughs> That's right. And if you notice the structure of the screen, if we shoved you to the side, there's room for Matt, right? <laughs> That, now he might be, we could consider him a fourth wheel, which might be a little awkward, but that's okay. For him, well, that's all right. We could just do like a Brady bunch of windows and have all of them on there. And, and who is it, Professor Black? He was probably um, at the top of the list for 
I, I want to say snark, but he was outright shady, outright shady when he was calling out neoliberal policy. And um, I got to go back to the uh, MMT. So I will say that uh, Bill Black, you have to have your like financial history. You got to be up on it because oh, yeah. 50% of those that shade is like advanced level. But you're like, wait a minute. Yes. Oh my if gosh! You, if you I can't know explain, in 1983, oh. <laughs> if, if, if you so don't weird. know the Keating Five, you're not invited to you're the conversation. <laughs> I say we find five more people, and then we put Bill in the center, and we'll be Hollywood Squares. <laughs> That's a perfect idea. Let's do it, Andy. You're brilliant. Right? Let's do it. Right. Right. There was one more thing I wanted to share. And this will give you not only a look into my mind, but show you the, the warptitude of it. Okay, I was making I was making a a short video of the town hall by Biden last night, and I came up with this great idea that you you know those those videos that people put where they have. You, you watch the screen intently and then they put a scary face up there to make you jump out of your skin, right? With the screen. Well, Joe Biden is the person you're watching and then the face of Hillary comes up and that'll scare the crap out of everybody. <laughs> okay. Is this a viral, you don't, the next viral video? And you don't know where to go with that, do you, Carrie? No, no, I don't. Well, it, actually, what I was looking at was the stream of comments that's coming in. Um, yes. Professor Yuli now has a fan club. So um, you're welcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, it's grown to more than two? More than two! <laughs> that's exactly right. So, um, so yeah, there, there's your social capital. So you got to come back and we'll grow the, the movement. That's right. <laughs> So I, I, I am here for that <laughs> grassroots action around me. Yes. <laughs> guaranteed, guaranteed with Carrie and I continuing to do this show at some point, we're really going to need a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Please. <laughs> or, or somebody come up with bail or something. You know. A bail fund <laughs> that that would actually do it. So I, um, I definitely I've got the law covered, but remember the lack of capital. That's right. <laughs> the lack of financial capital. I'm going to take all the money you paid me for this, put it in a fund. <laughs> That's your bail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we I do can't not have social... five on it. Oh, that's that's too funny. All right. Well, uh, unfortunately, we are now past the top of the hour. So we got to we got to call it quits. But oh, no. we're going to hold you to it and ask you to come back at some other point. Um, you know, this would be just phenomenal. But thank you so much for being here and for sharing such uh, Thanks for having me. electric wisdom. I'm I'm done for the day. I need to go get a cold shower now and just. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Luo. Just, uh, I absolutely love talking to you. And anytime you want to come back, please let us know. We'd love to have you back. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. This is great. Perfect. All right. So for everyone who's tuning in, go visit Professor Yuli on Twitter. Go see her website. She's got more great content there, as well as her phenomenal writing work. Just get into it. Just comfortable and, and read it all you will love it so thank you everyone and we hope you have a good day we will be back on friday where we have another amazing guest um daniel epstein who ran for state supreme court and he is dishing all the shade on how the court system actually works so um it is not at all what you think it is but um, he, he's going to come back and, and talk about all of these things. So thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Hope you have a wonderful day. So. All right. Thank you. This is Progressive Insider. Yeah.
Progressive insider, you know they wiser. Ooh, this that new media company covering everything. I'm talking that news you ain't heard of, cause you know it's getting better.